Good morning, everybody. And we are welcoming Blanca Baquero, who is, uh, uh, we're celebrating as part of us, our community of faith today. And there's a litany and uh, uh, we are doing one in, one out. Nancy Walkling is uh, uh, shortly moving to Ottawa. So uh, we are welcoming and saying adieu, but uh, that is just the nature of life. So, um, but a reminder to the community of faith that the annual con community of faith, we used to call it congregational, but I guess we should be calling it the annual community of faith meeting part two will be Sunday, June the 11th at the BHC, the Berks Heritage Chapel. That's June the 11th, a COFM part two. For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked on this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of the Mohawk, the Ganiangahaga, member of the Iroquoian Six Nations Confederacy, and acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. Remember, that was from T for the Tillerman, the album, with a little bit of Bach, I think, thrown in. And just one final comment. 
Uh, we will be honoring Asian Heritage Month in June, not May. Uh, we weren't able to have that in line, but it is in line uh, for the month of June. So we're doing uh, Asian Heritage Month on Filipino time. May the grace of our sovereign Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. As we are in the season of Easter and singing our alleluias, come children join to sing. is the communion into which you gather us. Your son has called us to continue his mission. Wait, may we be up to this vocation. Yet even here we are not abandoned because Christ promised not to leave us alone, but to send us a partner with wisdom and power. Send your Holy Spirit to call us by name and lead us home. We look to you with eager expectation, for you have promised gifts unimaginable and opened us to, to the delight and wonder of life. Send your Holy Spirit to call us by name and lead us home. Like a blazing fire, melt the stubborn grip of fear. Like a wild wind, Dispel the dust of complacency. Like a loon's call, pierce pride with joy. Send your Holy Spirit to call us by name and lead us home. Holy One, we beseech you now to hear the petitions on behalf of others that we bring before you first in silent prayer. To these concerns, we bring our urgent prayers for the Sudan and the ongoing crisis and escalating crisis there and the Ukraine. We seem to have such difficulty as humanity to live in harmony with one another. We pray for 
courage and strength for the leaders of nations gathered in Hiroshima. And that first off, they might be mindful where they gather. And may the road to peace start again there. And may we as a global community acknowledge the causes of conflict. Economic imbalance. Human greed. Insecurity. Fear of the neighbor. As a Christian community, may we put aside all fears and embrace a love that truly never ends. Oh God, hear our prayers. And in your love, answer. These are the concerns that weigh heavily on our hearts this morning that we now turn over to the grace of Christ. Amen. And at this time, I'd ask if both Blanca and Nancy would unmute and Grace will be participating. As we have a right for times of change in a community of faith. Our church, like any community, changes. Babies are born. Children grow up. Loved ones and friends grow old. People move into our community and church. Others leave us, moving on to new places, new experiences, and new opportunities. It is important to recognize these times of passage. Today, we welcome Blanca Banquero as she becomes officially part of our community of faith. Blanca, we bid you welcome to Mountainside United Church as part of our wider online community of faith. We, as this community of faith, now welcome you, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your prayers. May God bless you and keep you. May the face of God be present to you and the glory of God shine on you. And I want to say on behalf of all, and uh, may perhaps all you can do, the, 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 the silent uh, uh, sign of community. Uh, welcome, Blanca. Thank you. Thank, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're glad to have you. And I understand this is a, a, a new reality within the United Church of Canada uh, that we have a member uh, virtually and, and hopefully sometimes physically present with us. So we are so happy to have you. And uh, Nancy, for uh, being uh, the introducer to this community of faith. Today also, sadly, we bid adieu to Nancy Walkling as she officially leaves our community of faith. Nancy, we bid you farewell from Mountainside United Church. We as this community of faith take time now to acknowledge and thank you. You will be missed. We thank you, Nancy, for your presence, your gifts, your service, and your prayers. And we ask God to continue to bless you and others through you in your new community. May God bless you and keep you. May the face of God be present to you and the glory of God shine on you. God go with you. Thank you. And I believe Grace has something to add for Nancy. Um, I just want to take this moment to thank Nancy Walkling. We can all say that we are all blessed to know and have Nancy's friendship. I met Nancy over 15 years ago and when I joined the choir and the outreach committee. However, she has been part of the congregation for much longer. She has been a guide and a kind hearted friend always thinking of others and ways to encourage one another when we need it. 
She has sent Get Well and sympathy cards to the congregation. Also, she has managed to keep track of important historical items the church has collected over the years. Um, she has been the outreach treasurer and helping us to focus on the things that matter. As a choir member, I've had the pleasure of hearing her sing, lending her voice to us at practice and during worship. We will miss her as she journeys on the next chapter in her life. Thankfully, not so far away that I'm sure we can visit. Her friendship, kindness, and knowledge will be missed, but not forgotten. Thank you, Nancy, for everything you have done for our congregation. Thank you. And maybe people can wave a nice goodbye and thank you to Nancy. Who is my mother from More Voices 178? and stigmas, cultures, enigmas, all come together round Jesus Christ. Love will relate us, color, status, can't segregate us round Jesus Christ. Family failings, human derailings, all are accepted round Jesus Met for one mission, we claim each other round Jesus Christ. Here is my mother, here is my brother, kindred in spirit through Jesus Christ. Let us hear now some reflections on Luke part two. As I left, we're having an AC of F meeting part two. This is Luke part two, the Acts of the Apostles. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing upward toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. 
All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the witness of the early church. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is number 68, found in Voices United on page 787, with a sung refrain. God, and let your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. Like drifting smoke, disperse them. Like wax melting in the fire, let the wicked perish at your presence, O God. But let the righteous be glad and exult before you. Let them rejoice with exceeding joy. Sing praises to God's holy name. Make a highway for the one who rides the clouds. Be joyful and exult in God's presence. orphans, protector of widows, O God, in your holy dwelling. You give the lonely a home in which to live. You lead the prisoners out of prosperity, but the rebels must live in a wasteland. When you went out at the head of your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked the heavens poured down rain before you, God of Sinai, God of Israel. You sent down a generous rain. You refreshed your heritage when it languished. There your people found a home, which is your goodness you provided the poor. God, dominions of the earth, praise the one who has a dominion. The one who rides through the heavens, even the primal heavens, the one whose voice is the mighty thunder. Acknowledge the power that is God's, whose majesty is over Israel, whose strength is in the skies. You are awesome, O God, as you leave your sanctuary bringing power and strength to your people. Blessed are you, God of Israel. Blessed are you. This morning's gospel reading is from John chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you 
since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Write these words in our hearts, dear God. For more voices, number 49, when we seek language. I'm 
Being into prayer, into being. The readings this morning focused on the parting transfer of power from Jesus to the disciples, the witnesses for Christ. The John passage has the line that the motto of the United Church comes from, that all may be one, that we are one. It is that aspect of the Spirit's power to be witness in the world. And we're here at Trinity Sunday, moving towards next Sunday, Pentecost, where we speak of the church by the spirit now de deciding where it wishes to go. I decided to focus on the Acts reading because we will be looking at it as we always do next week. It is the story of Pentecost that uh, people love and the use of languages and we've experimented with that. And so I thought, let's not look at the images of clouds and, and, and that business, but uh, those who are gathered, they, this event happens on Olivet, not Volos. And it's a, we're told in this reading that it's a Sabbath day's journey from the Holy City. But they go back to the Holy City, they go back to the upper room, they go back to the place where what had happened all began and the announcement at table. And an early Christian would hear that and what they are doing when they go up into that worship space. Luke is reminding them of why they do what they do when they do. And so they're wondering what to do and what do they do they pray the suggestion is that prayer is not passive it's an action verb and i rather like the language i employed of being into prayer into being these days, we often say, well, what are you into? What do you like? But prayer is much richer than that. It's talking about our whole nature, our beingness. That we are created, we believe, to reflect divinity. That that mark, that seal is upon us. And so... The cyclical nature of prayer. Prayer that is opening oneself to the revelation of God and also to the mystery of God, which is unknowable. Again, cyclical. And much like we sang in that hymn, infinite, intimate, unbounded friend. Intimate. There's something intimate about a prayer life. But the infinite aspects of it. It can be solitude. Some used to go into a small room, a prayer closet to pray. Leaders were encouraged to do so during the Renaissance. But it could be many things from silent meditative prayer to community prayer, to litanies of prayer, to prayer walks. For me, prayer sometimes takes the form of a great gallery or a great exhibition to 
wander from my world into the world of artists and what they have seen. We spend a lot of time thinking of prayer as words. But to me, prayer can equally be images and colors and relationships of those. Well, I'm kind of into that, as you know. And so I thought this morning we would look at prayer walking through the world of art and focusing primarily on the same period as the music you'll hear, Gabriel Faure, the Belle Epoque. The next slide. Well, perhaps one of the most famous. My grandma Troop had a print of that on her wall. It was one of the first images of prayer I can remember later, and, and many still like the juror drawing of hands, the praying hands. But uh, this seemed to be very special. I don't know, did any of your, uh, your parents or grandparents have this image somewhere in the house? It was painted in 1857. And it shows the Angelus, the evening prayer. Francois Millet said when painting this, it reminded him of his grandmother who used to make them stop work in the fields when they heard the bell ring from the steeple as they recited the prayer. It's been talked about as something marked Quebec for many, many, many years before the radical change in the quiet revolution. But so you have on the horizon, highlighted in the golden light, the steeple. Its position mirrored by the woman, the hands clasped, gathering, and the farmer removes his hat, and they're both bowed. It's an internal, intimate, inward response. They're poor. Uh, they're trying to gather what they can of the potatoes in the fields. And if you only ate potatoes, ask anyone of Irish heritage, you weren't doing so well. So it was humbleness, being of the earth, and prayer in that sense. But there's a sentimentality to it, and, and there's a danger in sentimentality in art, as I think in theology. It uh, sometimes prevents us from going deeper into that which is profound. So let's move on a few years towards our time to a palette that discovers new pigments and brighter colors. The next slide. The Church in Auvergne by Vincent van Gogh. Well, most of us still say van Gogh, 1890. Painted in the last year of his troubled life. Van Gogh's father was a Protestant minister and van Gogh himself uh, embarked on that and in the Walloon region of Belgium, where he painted the potato eaters, he was seeing both. So a good solid Protestant upbringing with its wonders and problems. Heaven is not entirely welcoming in this painting, but there is someone on a road and there are two roads diverging to go around this church. And you're asked to choose one. The turmoil in the heavens is mirrored in the turmoil and the dark, dark blue of the stained glass. 
the strong contrast of colors, the strong journey that Van Gogh was on at this time. We have letters to his brother Theo uh, talking about him uh, wanting uh, to leave something and, and, and maybe some life insurance or something for him. So hence the question, was it suicide or as there are boys in the fields where he was found having been shot, was it murder? We'll never know. But we do know that Vincent was troubled and felt badly having been uh, so much a burden on his brother who was now going through a difficult time. The art market had turned and he was a dealer. So Vincent, Protestant in France, becomes friends, well, until he decides to cut off the bottom of his ear with another painter that we'll be looking at more intensely in the next slide. Paul Gauguin. As I said, they were friends. And as we'll find out, Gauguin had his own story in the church and continued that relationship throughout his life, exploring God and prayer from this young woman in Brittany to the vision after the sermon. I don't know what visions, what prayers are you going to have after this sermon? They heard the story about struggling with God. Jacob wrestling with God across the Jabbok. And you see the Jabbok line, the river diagonally cutting across. And they're internal, but in their internal prayer, they're out into this vision on this bright red field of the spirit. And the wings are unfurled and ready to soar. And they're amazed. And, and though many are looking inward, uh, one is looking out at this scene. Is she the one that sees this? Is that her prayer? Or is she just the one that's peeking, as people often do? I remember Professor Johnson, the Reverend Professor, uh, blessing with the sign of the cross, and I've adopted that. And I once had a comment, uh, uh, you, 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 you blessed us. And I said, well, how did you know? Well, I was looking. I said, well, you're not supposed to. Well, she's looking. She's peeking. And then Van Gogh himself in front of his painting called The Yellow Christ, and there are people praying below it. If you look at that, that's in Buffalo. You could go over to Buffalo to see it. And Gauguin himself, an interesting character of Spanish Peruvian descent, minor nobility. Question, so a global traveler, but was born in Paris, but had gone across. Uh, we're at the age when the world is opening and travel people are traveling more often. And he was with the, the Maritime and he also was a stockbroker before he started to go into painting full time. So he seems focused on prayer and that spiritual journey. He said once, I shut my eyes in order to see. I shut my eyes in order to see. He was primarily self-taught. And he decided that color and the influence of Japanese art could make him create new images of a spiritual journey. The next slide, please. And so he puts himself in the face of Christ in Gethsemane. And you see the betrayers in the gully coming towards him. And the shocking orange, the contrast. Prayer is action. His hands 
is that a handkerchief in his in his grasp or is that paper is it a piece of Torah is it a prayer that he's written as Jesus struggles with what is to come and whether or not to accept that so it's a moment of prayer and maybe he himself found at times persecuted he felt that when he gave his life to exploring art it wasn't initially well received people had problems with him and his radically different view. Think that this is the time of your grandparents, maybe great grandparents, to see such shocking image and bright color and a painter who puts himself in the face of Christ. And perhaps they didn't know that another artist who did that was in the Sistine, in the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo. The next slide. And he travels and perhaps most famously known for his travels uh, to Polynesia, to Tahiti, to French Polynesia. And two images here, and you can see the, the, the titles he's written them. Hail Mary, Ave Maria, written in the language of Tahiti. And you have Mary with the Christ child, and they are signified traditionally by the halos. And the onlookers have their gesture of prayer. They are reverencing in this beautiful recreation, this tropical paradise. The other painting, painted in Paris, the day of the God. And there's debate about whether this Deity is the Maori creator or Tahitian understanding, but the women are dancing a creative dance, a dance to engender procreation uh, that uh, the Christian church there tried to ban, uh, much like uh, our church and others on the West Coast try to ban the potlatch and, and traditions and dances. And you have this incredible world of color. It's a return to Eden, a return to a spirituality that in Gauguin's opinion, the world had left behind. That civilization, so-called, had robbed it of a deep, deeper, richer, prayer life, spirituality, relationship with God. You may uh, find problems uh, that I'm using uh, what was an idol in an aspect of prayer. And they're bringing an offering too. But Gauguin didn't have a problem. And we know that Gauguin was buried in the Catholic cemetery, very close to the bishop. So probably not as much a problem. When you're far away from the power centers, uh, boundaries blur a bit. And so you have this color of a woman washing in a river going into this beautiful ocean and an idyllic life and an idyllic reality. Is this the kingdom to come? Is this what paradise and life in paradise, when our prayers are active in the presence of God, would be like. The next slide. I told you that Gauguin also had an interesting background. For he himself had been a student at the Petit Seminaire in La Chapelle Saint-Menin near Orléans, south of Paris. And he was there from 11 to the age of 16. He knew his catechism, he knew his liturgy, he knew his dogma. It was a conservative Catholic school uh, where he was educated. He was being raised uh, to be a good burger. And in the catechism were three 
fundamental questions. Perhaps you can remember this. I remember when in Kadiko Kedida lessons, uh, where we were stronger about that at one point. I remember the, the pamphlet that we used in the United Church of Canada, it was blue with a, a globe on it. Perhaps you do as well. Where, where does humanity come from? Of course, the dogma answer. Where is it going to life in paradise with Christ? And how does humanity uh, proceed? Remember those questions from when you uh, were seeking to join the church? It's interesting, these questions from the catechism, because in one of Gauguin's late paintings that he himself saw as his greatest statement on faith, the next painting. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Well, if you want to go and see this, you go to Boston. It's a large painting. And to be read like friezes from left to right. You have birth and the child, almost like the child in, on straw, the, the straw nativity. And the parents watching to youth, a young man and a young woman. And the young man is reaching up and grabbing passion fruit, tropical fruit, Adam and Eve, the moment of estrangement from the garden of paradise. But the move through redemption and faith, you have dogs throughout and these spirit birds, and you end in the bird messenger. Those who have spent some time on the West Coast might know Margaret Craven's book, I Heard the Owl Call My Name. And maybe some of you have read that. The tradition there that the owl tells you when it's your time to leave this life. And so you have the white bird next to the old woman crouching as she prepares to leave. And in the passage in between, uh, towards as we go to our later years, the divinity shows again. Perhaps we're in the thralls of life and the busyness of life and the romance of life. The concept of a creating God seems far away. But as we age and reflect and look at where we have come from and what we are and wondering where we are going, then we invite God back into our lives and perhaps spend more time in prayer as we understand it. The cycle of life, the cycle of prayer, being into prayer, into being. I shut my eyes in order to see. Amen. Puisque mi tout en fleur, tant les plus nous réclame, viens te la se peut de mêler à ton âme. Accompagne les bois, les 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My Lord, what a morning.
the apostles, along with his brothers and mother and the women present, equally witnesses and first among the faithful, dedicate ourselves to prayer and the amazing energy and beauty to be found there. And may God guide us into this state of relationship, of blessing and blessedness. And may we bring that sense of being to our ministries and our lives and God's world. Amen. This concludes our formal worship service. We thank you for being present. Your presence is a blessing to us and this community of faith. And a reminder, next Sunday, Pentecost is Holy Communion. And at five o'clock in the evening at Lauderdale, a 
potluck supper and there'll be an email out about that. We've been invited to a potluck feast on Pentecost. That's next Sunday. 